the first part of the lecture, Dr. Umar would be happy to address those now. Yes. You mentioned in passing in your introductory comments that um, Eastern civilizations also took a very negative impression of Islam during the colonial period, and I didn't fully understand what you were getting at with that, and whether um, you know, like what what the the impression that um, Western world had of the Muslim world became very negative, and it still st it remains very negative for various reasons. It seems that there's not a very positive impression of Islam in the Eastern world as well, in places uh, uh, around Asia where you know I spent some time in the last few years, and mm -hmm. I get a sense that many of the same um, prejudices exist now. And I'm wondering if that's a colonial legacy, or is that really just a modern phenomenon related to 9/11 and some other yeah. uh, more recent uh, events? Well, that's a very good uh, question. Uh, first of all, I don't think that I said what you understood. Uh, what I said, I believe this is what you may have misunderstood, was that um, the cultural offensive of the Western world under colonialism, it inadvertently uh, spurred a cultural counter-offensive from those civilizations that fell under colonial control. That happened in Japan. Japan was not directly ruled, but it was certainly affected. And it happened in India among Hindus. It happened uh, among Buddhists and other groups. And Muslims were one of those. So that's the point that I was trying to make. Uh, whether the East had a negative impression of Muslims or not, I think that's a different issue. And I wouldn't believe that really to be a valid generalization. Uh, Chinese civilization, for example, uh, has a very, very positive relationship with Islam that goes back to the very beginning of the Islamic era. And the Chinese virtually cultivated that themselves. And I think one of the things that we have to look at when we talk about the Western attitude towards Islam is the fact that Western European civilization in particular, and Muslim Mediterranean civilization, and Near Eastern civilization, they occupy overlapping territorial domains. And so therefore, they naturally compete with each other. And for that reason, Islam for the West has been traditionally too close for comfort even though Islam shared uh, the same theological vocabulary, uh, essentially the same beliefs about heaven and hell and judgment, uh, the beliefs in the prophets and so forth. But Islam was too close geopolitically. And then also you might say that ideologically it was too close too because it was a missionary religion. And Christianity was a missionary religion. And the Jews were often go-betweens, by the way, between Europe and the Muslim world. That's very, very interesting. But um, the situation that pertained to Islam in the Western world is not necessarily that of the Eastern world. In India, you have a different situation. But in India, uh, the reception of Islam, and this is, of course, a really hot-button political issue, but the reception of Islam um, tended to be very favorable. It had at least favorable aspects. And of course, India is a big place, including Pakistan and Bangladesh. But um, what will happen between Islam and Hinduism in India, in fact, is Muslims give Hinduism its name as a religion because it is a conglomeration of many teachings that often don't share a whole lot in common. But uh, what happens with the rise of colonialism and then also uh, the nation state in the 20th century is that Hindu nationalism develops. And it then takes its own particular view of Islam and its role in India 
and so forth. But um, is that enough for you, or is that does that raise another question? Sorry. Uh, anyway, I don't think there's anything off topic. <laughs> there's no such thing as a bad question. There's certainly bad answers, and I hope I don't give any. So then I think now we can resume. So what we talked about before then is essentially uh, the remarkable fact that in this global world, all people have come together. And whenever that happens, it produces amazing changes. It produces profound challenges for religions. And in the history of religions, and we talked about the development of Christianity that's very, very important. Um, you know, the religions have to make sense in the time that they live. And um, if they don't do that, then they fall to the wayside. It's often said, for example, that paganism in Rome was dead at the time of Jesus Christ. You know, and that's because of the fact that paganism as Latin religion, it was very much tied to the upper class of the Latins. And it didn't speak to the vast majority of Romans. And so therefore, you have the emergence of Stoicism, and which is a religious philosophy, and of Neoplatonism. And then also, you have Christianity. And you have the cult of Isis and other things. So this is a very important factor in the time that we live in. You have a new religious movement every day. In fact, they usually, sometimes they say two on the average every day. So, and this reflects the way that human beings are. And then in speaking about that, we talked also about the Islamic or the Muslim counter-offensive to the rise of colonialism and Western influence. And that, and this is a big generalization that I made, and of course, uh, there can be a lot of uh, objections that are made to it, but that in general, uh, in that counteroffensive that came out of the Muslim world, especially looking at places like India and Egypt and elsewhere, that uh, one of the characteristics of it was to jettison the tradition. And what I mean by tradition is the fact that Islam, like many religions, but not like all religions, um, is transmitted. And one of our basic beliefs in Islam is the fact that religion is not taken from books, and that it's not just from words, but that it's taken from teachers, men and women. And these teachers are authorized, and they have chains of transmission. And that transmission takes you back to the oral tradition. And that oral tradition and the written tradition together link you with the revealed phenomenon in the very beginning. So um, for many Muslims, and for myself, uh, this is a living reality. And it would be that way for many Christians, and many Jews, and many others for Hindus, for Vedantists, and others. So in their response to the challenge, it was typical of many of the reformers. And we can probably safely say that this is the default position of many Muslims in the United States, if not most Muslims in the United States, because we're not that different from the Muslim world at large. But that is that the tradition has no relevance for us. OK, and of course, you're not required in Islam to believe in the tradition. Um, that's not an essential part of the faith. But it is, generally speaking, not wise if you have a rich tradition that has been cultivated by thousands and thousands of people and that has also produced uh, very significant global civilizations that you throw it away if you don't even know what it is. And um, it's better first to look at it and to see what it was, how it was formed, uh, what accomplishments it made in the past, uh, what kind of things it is able to, uh, to accomplish also in the present. And then we can decide what we want to do with that tradition. I myself 
um, believe that the tradition is extremely rich and extremely meaningful. And I feel that if we want to do anything with Islam that will be of great value, then we have to plug into that tradition. So this is where we've gotten to right now. And the next point that I'd like to make is the fact that in the context of these massive global changes that have taken place over the last 200 years, uh, one of those remarkable things, even though it would be just right now a small footnote in the Muslim world, is the fact that an Islamic community, a Muslim community, developed in the United States. The roots of this go back a long time. You have Muslim roots in America that go back long before you know, uh, the 19th century. But especially in the last 100 years, there has been the rise of an indigenous Muslim community, primarily African American, primarily inner city after the great migrations, and then in the, from the mid-60s on, again in the context of the Cold War and uh, globalism, you have um, the United States changing its immigration policy, uh, getting rid of the racial quotas that had been uh, very strong before that, and opening the door to immigration. And uh, this has a lot to do with the Civil Rights Act and civil rights activity as well. But because of this, then in the United States today, we have uh, a very significant Muslim community. And that community is well represented here tonight. And um, we are members of that community, and we need to be able to assess what that community's responsibility is and also what that, community's what that community's opportunities are in the context of the world that we live in today. The United States, when it opened up its doors to Muslim immigration, um, it sought a particular type of persona. And those were primarily doctors and engineers. It sought people who were already westernized and who generally had been to Western universities and colleges, <clears throat> who could speak English, and who could come to the United States and who could contribute in medicine and engineering in particular, but also in other fields. So our community and the community in Canada are very, very similar in the, in the fact that because of the way that immigration worked in the United States, um, we are very highly educated. Of course, that education is skewed in the direction of technology and science and medicine and computers and things like that. And these highly educated people are also people who, have, who bring with them a culture of study, a culture of knowing how to teach children how to study, and therefore their children and their children's children tend to be very successful. They tend to be very capable. Uh, they often have a good financial support, and uh, therefore they are a great resource. So this is where we are right now. And therefore, um, it's very important for us to utilize uh, this community and to uh, galvanize this community in the best way possible. Muslims in the United States are a small minority. Um, some people would say that we're not 1% of this country. Most people would probably say that we're somewhere between 1% and 2%. And um, I look upon that as an advantage. Um, Muslims in the United States have all the problems that Muslims have anywhere else. And Zarina Grewal, who teaches at Yale, um, put out uh, 
published a book that came out this last year called Islam as a Foreign Country. And it's really, really a valuable study of the American Muslim community and some of the ideological and sociological and other issues that pertain to it. But so we, we are very much part of the Muslim world. Uh, any problems that are there, they're also going to be reflected here. Uh, we are not immune to anything that they're not immune to either. And when we talk about the tradition and the fact that very few Muslims, especially Sunni Muslims, have an understanding of how central the tradition is to our civilization in the past, well, that's also the default position of most American Muslims. We don't know the tradition. We're not taught about it. We don't know that it's relevant. We don't know how to relate to it. But nevertheless, uh, our community has a lot of talent, and it has a lot of interest. And interestingly, uh, over the last three decades, um, a strong interest has developed in the United States and in Canada and also in Europe and between converts and also between Muslims of the second generation in the tradition. And we talk about the tradition. There are others who are very much against it and who are very vocal in their opposition to it. But there are many of us who use that word. We don't necessarily know what it means, and we might not be able to speak about the tradition in anything that goes very far beyond platitudes. But nevertheless, um, we have a community that is capable of learning. We have a capable a community right now which is producing scholars. Uh, some of those uh, young, upcoming scholars are sitting right here with us. And they're very intelligent. They're very gifted. Um, it's amazing also that a lot of the you know, Muslims in all the universities and all the colleges of the United States Often the valedictorians of, of universities in the United States and Canada will be uh, Muslims who in some cases have uh, two majors and in some cases even three. I know an instance of that, of a woman who was remarkably brilliant in three fields and she was the valedictorian of her university. So where do we go with people like that? And uh, we have many things happening in our communities this is the time of institution building um, and, and so forth. But we have got to be building and developing educational institutions that can um, respond to who we are in this time, what we believe in, how it relates to uh, modern science, to technology, to the environment, how it relates to the United States and the constitutional tradition, uh, what we feel about American values and so forth. And this has to be profoundly theological. And in my belief and in my experience, if that is not connected to the Islamic tradition, then I don't believe that it can go very far. We can't reinvent the wheel. And we have to see what was actually done in the past. And um, I believe that especially in environments like this, uh, the Theological Consortium uh, around the University of Chicago in Hyde Park, that we have an excellent opportunity to get really good students and to teach them about the tradition in a way that is critical but profound, and then also to speak about what is modernity, what is post-modernity, uh, what is the nature of modern science, and what are the myths of modern science, as well as the very valid insights of modern science and technology. OK, this is a, you know, a, an ambience and there, are, and there are others like this as well, where all the things come together that enable us, hopefully, to master the tradition, to benefit from the tradition, and then also to understand where the world is today. We're on the cutting edge of 
the philosophy, uh, the technology, the science you know, of the modern world. And those kind of things are remarkably difficult in many parts of the Muslim world. In fact, you might almost say that they're impossible. Again, as we said, uh, you know, the state of crisis is not necessarily the best situation in which to find meaningful solutions to problems. And the Muslim world is in severe crisis. It is in severe disorder. And it's been that way for a long time, and probably it will continue to be that way. And we in the United States and Canada, we suffer with that. We feel that very strongly. But nevertheless, you know, we are able to move beyond that and above that. And we are able, in many cases, to find the kind of academic and educational environment where we can calmly assess what happened, where were we, and where can we go. Um, in the Judaic tradition, uh, we often, when we talk about God and we talk about uh, human beings and we talk about the world, uh, speak of it in terms of the prophetic law or the rabbinic law or scriptural commentary. Uh, in this regard, Muslims and Jews are very similar. Also, the law for us is an extremely central part, as is the commentary on the revealed tradition. When Christians talk about religion, we often use the word theology very broadly. And although Christians, when they use the word theology, talk about God, the attributes of God, human beings in the world, and so do Jews in their exoteric and esoteric traditions. But often Christians will talk about the theology of worship or the theology of ecology or the theology of liberation and things like that. And um, therefore, I think, first of all, it's very important to understand that in the Islamic tradition, the discourse about God and the discourse about human beings, who we are, what is our anthropology, what is our poten potential, can we transcend ourselves to be something greater than we are, and then about the world in general. Uh, this is a discourse which uh, was general in Islamic civilization and very profound but it usually began in different buckets. It, there were different categories in which you begin it. That's not to say that we can't talk about a theology of worship, although that would be for us essentially law, or that we cannot talk about a theology of ecology, but that would be for us fundamentally law. In Islamic law, for example, you have the rights of God, you have the rights of human beings, you have the rights of animals, you have the rights of water, and so forth. This is a big part of Islamic law, and that is ecology. And Islamic societies were supposed to be ecological, and often they were quite successful at that, as a matter of fact, in the pre-modern world. Uh, so we have these different buckets, and um, they also reflect different gradations uh, in the way that Muslims approach knowledge. So in talking about theology per se, Muslims traditionally restricted that discourse to three topics. The first of those was God, establishing the existence of God, how the world proves that God exists, the attributes of God, the act of God, and then they would talk about also other things that are related to that, especially how God, who is the Lord of space and time, relates to the creation and human beings and their will that exist within space and time. Okay, so, and that's fundamentally theology, discourse about God. And then it would also talk about prophetology. And here, essentially, Islam was concerned with a particular doctrine that related to the prophets, and that is the Islamic doctrine of prophetic infallibility. 
And then there are other things that come out of that as well. And then the third topic was the things heard from the prophets. And that would be a discussion about the unseen, the end of time, uh, and also a number of peripheral theological issues. So that's really what theology was. And it didn't usually go beyond that. And theology as such in the traditional Islamic world was regarded to be the first and foremost religious obligation. Very few Muslims study it today. And again, if we look at our community around us, uh, very few Muslims would even have an idea of what it talks about or how it does that, or even that that's possible. And uh, also, they would not be convinced or aware of its relevance. Okay, but this is a very rich field, and it is a field that was primarily concerned with the fundamentals. And in Islamic parlance, that meant that what were the fundamentals of faith that are clearly and contextually indicated in the revealed sources. And Muslims always made a sharp distinction between things that if you believe in Islam and you believe in its revelation, then there's no debate about them. They're very clear, like the oneness of God. And then other things that require the exercise of judgment, ijtihad, which is the majority of legal issues. Law is especially a matter that requires the exercise of ijtihad, but it also has its foundations. And in the case of theology also, it was fundamentally concerned with consensus. In other words, like what is the basic creed? What are the things that all Muslims who are of sound mind and mature uh, should believe and should accept? Okay, so therefore it doesn't go very far in its, its, its basis, although it's capable of going very far indeed. And often it does that, although those issues are no longer creedal. For example, how, it, how do we speak of God's relationship to future time if he creates the world timelessly? Okay, that's a big issue in theology, but it's not required. It's not consensual. It's not a matter of consensus. And then you have law, and law was the fundamental concern of Muslims, as it was also with rabbinic Jews. And the law was extremely rich, and issues, as we said before, like ecology, uh, even like liberation and liberty, um, and uh, worship, and so many other issues. They are, anything that pertains to ethics and virtue, anything that pertains to human transactions, moral and ethical or otherwise. Those always would begin in the bucket of law. And in the next lecture that we have, where we talk about diversity and tolerance, we want to give an illustration of that. How you begin here with the law, and what the law says about that, and then look at the theological implications of it. So it begins in that bucket, but it doesn't necessarily stay there. And in law, also, you have things like, what are the purposes of the law? What are the ultimate objectives of the law? And you have things also like culture. So for example, if Muslims live in the United States, can they dress like Americans? Can they eat like Americans? And um, in traditional Islamic law, the law was never culturally predatory. It was a law that uh, served as a cultural filter. It wouldn't take everything, but it would take everything that was regarded to be consonant with Islam. And therefore, Islam would take on the color of the culture that it went to. It was said traditionally that Islam is like a river, and that river has no color in its water. Its water is crystal clear, and it's sweet and pure. But it will always reflect the rocks, or the sand, or the soil over which it flows. So if it flows over green stones, it looks green. And if it flows over red stones, it looks red. And therefore, if Islam is in China, it looks extremely Chinese. 
remarkably Chinese, and yet you cannot mistake the fact that it is Islam, and it is authentic. And any Muslim can see that. You don't have to be told. Uh, and in West Africa, it's West African. In Bosnia, it's European. Uh, it always takes on the color of where it is. Again, one of the big problems that we face in uh, the Muslim community today, especially in the case of a lot of uh, contemporary Muslims who don't follow the tradition and don't know the tradition, is that they are very culturally predatory. And they regard the sunnah of the prophet, peace be upon him, essentially to be a culture. So you have to dress a particular way always. You have to eat a particular way always, and that would be a travesty of the tradition. In fact, uh, many of our great traditional scholars said that the sunnah of the prophet is to follow what is good in the cultures of other people. So law there is a very, very important uh, bucket as well. And these two, theology and law, are the most basic. They are the fundamental ones. Then also you have the ethical tradition. And some people would call it the psychological tradition of Islam. Um, you can also call it a spiritual tradition. This is the kind of tradition that is represented very well in people like Imam al-Ghazali and his book, Ihya Ulum al-Din, the revivification of the religious sciences, and also in many other books, Ar-Raghib al-Isfahani and uh, Abu Talib al-Makki and others. And this tradition is also very, very important because it is the one that talks about ethics and values as practiced in human lives. And it focuses on the reality of the inner dimensions of human beings and the heart and especially the fact <clears throat> that the human being has immense potential and the human being can transcend himself or herself to be um, worthy of the vistrancy of God on earth. Okay, so this is very rich. And here also, the kind of things that are talked about in theology, like for example, the primacy of intellect, which is an extremely important topic uh, they're also talked about here, except for the fact that it's emphasized that if we don't cultivate virtue in ourselves, then the human intellect will never work. And when that virtue is cultivated, then the human intellect or the heart, you know, it will tap into infinite resources that are in the human being. And then finally, you have uh, the tradition of practical Sufism and metaphysical Sufism. Uh, for many Muslims who um, reject the tradition, uh, Sufism would be regarded to be an unspeakable word and something that has nothing whatsoever to do with Islam, although in the traditional Islamic world, it was regarded to be right at the center, and it was regarded to be the culmination of everything that Islam was about in terms of its teachings and its legal practices. And here, there are a lot, there's a lot of richness that is there, which especially in our time is extremely useful because of the fact that as Sufism develops in Islamic history, it also produces the phenomenon of what is often called metaphysical Sufism. And metaphysical Sufism then has a discourse with Islamic theology, with Islamic law, with Islamic philosophy, with Islamic science, and we could say actually with the whole civilization of Islam. And it sometimes accepts things and sometimes rejects things, but it also goes to other levels and other depths. And uh, there, for example, you talk about things like the nature of reality. Is reality simple or complex? Which is a very important question today. Modern science is very powerful because of its applications. And technology is one of its most obvious applications. But the worldview of modern science is one that is very reductionist. And it is one that tends to look at things in the simplest possible terms. 
although modern science has now found that it can't explain things that way anymore. And in the Islamic worldview that is elucidated in metaphysical Sufism, then we have the concept of the absolute and the relative, and the concept of the one and the infinite many, and the fact that reality is in fact, is in fact very complex, and time and space are also very complex. And uh, there are different levels of reality. And there is a sense in which all relative truths are true. But then there are also absolute truths, which are more true and more felicitous. So these are very sophisticated traditions. And, um, Mike, uh, and Stephen Hawking, in the book that he wrote in 2012, The Grand Design, uh, he presents a very popularized, although very brilliant, uh, application of quantum theory and modern physics uh, to cosmology. And uh, one of the interesting responses of that is the response of Wolfgang Smith, who is also a physicist, and who is also a Christian theologian and a Thomist. But one of the things that he shows is that if you go back to the traditional views of the world that are reflected in Thomist uh, co cosmology, but also in the cosmologies of other religions, and the Islamic religion would be here too, although he doesn't talk about that, then you see that the very things that Stephen Hawking is talking about are the very things they talked about as well except for the fact that they understand that as a window into cosmogenesis in which you're not, in which all that infinite possibility which Hawking talks about, which is there in the subatomic world, it is actually sub-existential. And the missing link here is what we call essence. That's a metaphysical category, but it's something that is very important in, tradition, in many traditional religions, and not all, and especially in the Islamic tradition. And therefore, you have to talk about the corporeal world, and you have to talk about the world that's below it, and then you have a totally different view of what's happening. So this is valuable, and this is something that you know, enables us to make sense. And when we look at the Islamic tradition in this broad way, we see that there are many things that we can tap into and that we can take advantage of. And in fact, among those are the very arts and crafts and the architecture and the sciences of Islamic civilization. Because the sciences that Islamic civilization produced, they also talked often about the same facts that modern science talks about, but they talked about them in very different ways. And that's because of the fact that they had metaphysics, and they had a cosmology, and they had universal principles. And therefore, their science was able also to be applied and to be effective, but it brought with it a very different worldview. So I feel that uh, one of the challenges that faces us, and that it's very important for us to meet, especially as Muslims in this country, and that would apply also to Canada, above the border. Of course, European Muslims are welcome, and some of our most brilliant scholars are Europeans and, uh, and, and also British scholars as well. But you know, the European community, although it also has great potential, it's very different from the community here in the sense that it doesn't have the same demographic. And therefore, the, the problems that it faces you know, are of a different nature. And that should also be our concern. It's not to write them off. But you know, here in the United States and in Canada as well, you have a great deal to work with right now that enables us to establish institutions and to develop institutions that, that can begin to define the position of Islam in our lives as Muslims in a way that is not alien to us and does not alienate us from ourselves, and that enables us to make a positive con contribution, and hopefully also enables us to make a positive contribution to the society at large. So let's stop there and open up the floor again to questions. Ansur.
Uh, do you think, oh, sorry, which one of those four areas that you mentioned, uh, theology, law, uh, the ethical tradition, or practical metaphysical Sufism is the area that uh, you know, we as a community need to focus on most in developing in order to relate and... Um, uh, I think that... What's uh, our greatest priority? I, I think that um, at the academic level, we need to be able to be conversant with that all. And I think that uh, at the communal level, then always we have priorities because of the fact that Islam has to remain something that is very accessible for the ordinary Muslim. And then beyond that, you go to different grades. So in the society at large, theology and law are very basic. And uh, the ordinary Muslim may not go into great depths in either of those. But the entirety of this tradition in a holistic way is something that we have to respect and we have to cultivate, we have to see how did the Islamic civilizations of the past work? What did they produce? And how did they do that? And if you don't take the whole tradition, then you'll never be able to see that. Yes. Um, my question is, how do we develop an intelligentsia here in America, or the United States rather, um, so that we can re reassert ourselves in national discourse and create a framework mm -hmm. um, to determine which conversations are most necessary for us to engage ourselves in? Mm -hmm. um, and what would the role of an intelligentsia be here in the United States? Would they strictly be academics? How do you balance the role of being an academic and then having this information to relate to laymen and women, excuse me, but it, like, um, so I guess that's a loaded question, but what, what, what's our framework? Uh, the word intelligentsia is, I think, um, a word that has a lot of implications in it. And um, I don't know myself that I would actually want to use that word. Um, intelligentsias are usually elites and maybe they even look upon themselves as that. But I think that what is very important for us is to create something which has already begun to develop, and uh, that is a community of scholars. And when we talk about a community of scholars, uh, I mean by that that you have a community of scholars who have uh, good training, and uh, who have competence, and who work together, and who uh, study and teach together, uh, who agree on certain fundamentals, okay? And then they begin to, uh, to map out the ground and to take things forward. Uh, for example, in the history of the West, um, Isaac Newton is absolutely fundamental in the creation of modern science. That goes without saying, but there's no reason why it needs to go without saying. Because in fact, Newton would not have been able to affect the West in the way that he did if a community of scholars had not developed around him who understood what Newton was saying and then who could take it forward. And in the early 20th century, you have the same thing that happens around things like quantum physics. And before that, relativity and Einstein, although Einstein never really got on board with quantum theory, okay? And he never really was able to accept that fully. But around quantum theory in particular, you have definitely a large community of scholars who understand what they're talking about. And then they are able to take it forward. They know what its implications are. So that quantum theory has become one of the most influential and important uh, physical theories of all times. So for us also, we have right now a community that I'm very proud to be a member of. And we have brilliant men and women in this community in the United States, Canada, and elsewhere. And many times we're friends. Most of us here are friends. We know each other. We're a small community. 
And that's something that's very much to our advantage. But it's very important that that become a community of scholars who, if they can agree, and maybe they can, but to the extent that we can agree, then we buy into certain fundamentals. We accept a particular world worldview. We understand how that will work for us, how it will accomplish all the different things that we want to do, including things that are not intellectual, but things that are pertain to social justice and other issues. Okay, and then that community has a huge effect. <clears throat> Institutions, in my belief, should house communities of scholars, especially for us, if we are to have something that would be an effective Muslim seminary, for example, then it should be an institution <clears throat> that is able to cultivate and to house a community of scholars. And once you do that, then you begin to have powerful effect. Um, if you look at Fox News, which I don't know how many people here do look at Fox News, but one of the interesting things in Fox News is that in Fox News, on Fox News, you can actually ask the question of what school of Islamic law does Obama actually belong to? And you can say that without anybody laughing. In fact, they're really interested, like, yes, what school is he? You know? And although I wouldn't say that Fox News benefits from a community of scholars, if it does, I don't know that they're very ethical scholars. You know? But the thing is, is that you have many people, including thinkers and think tanks, who buy into a particular program that Fox News endorses. And it cultivates that in radio talk shows and in other things all over the country so that ultimately you're able to say something like that and no one thinks it's funny. Okay, so communities of scholars are extremely important. And to me, this is what we have to have our eyes on. And we are developing institutions. Zaytuna is a beautiful institution. And uh, the people, the young people that I have talked with who have now completed their undergraduate education at Zaytuna, uh, some of whom will be coming here uh, next year, um, they've told me that this was the best education that we ever had. And, uh, you know, so this is a great accomplishment, an outstanding accomplishment. And it's a liberal arts college that takes itself very seriously. Okay, so that's wonderful. Now, what will we do at the graduate level? What, we, what will we do at the postgraduate level? And the kind of work that we have to do is monumental. It is not the work of one man or one woman. It cannot be. It has, it has got to be the work of a community of scholars. And again, to go back to your question, uh, the community of scholars also is the group that articulates things in such a way, such as, for example, the physicists that do quantum theory, because they talk about, on a popular level, uh, you know, what are the implications of this, although I don't agree with those implications, because I don't agree with certain aspects of their philosophy, like the denial of essence. Okay? But that's what they do. That has profound effect. And c communities of scholars then are also able to take the ideas that we believe in, the truths that we believe in as religious people, and they are able to make that meaningful on the popular level. Yes. Thank you. I deeply appreciate the, the reverence I feel um, in your energy and words about tradition. And um, I think I understand, um, though you use it in the singular tradition, um, that, that you mean an engagement of understanding that holds the varieties or discontinuities, maybe. Uh, I'm largely a layperson on Islamic history, so I, I wonder if you could help me with some generalizations even. Uh, about how, how you would describe the continuities 
and the discontinuities in tradition or the places that you could firmly attest um, to be continuous versus innovations or variations? That's a big question. Um, Arnold Toynbee believed that religion is a very important part of civilization. And Arnold Toynbee believed, like a number of 20th century thinkers uh, and 21st century thinkers, that human beings are, we are homo belligerans, we are man, the maker of war. We are homo faber, we are man, the maker of tools. We are homo sapiens, man, the knower. But we are also homo religiosus, we are man, who has religion, and human beings usually have that in their history. Toynbee talks about that a lot. Certainly historians don't have a consensus on what he says. Many of them don't uh, even like his approach to history. But one of the things that he insists on is that religion must have continuity, and it must have community. And the two go together in a very powerful way. And um, I use the word tradition in the singular because what I mean by that is a particular type of continuity that comes through living transmission, that comes through men and women. And it's very important to stress that in the Islamic tradition, women have been a big part of it. Women scholars have been often more important even than men, even though it would be hard to believe that today. Okay, but they are people who inherit what we believe to be the prophetic legacy. And we believe that that same phenomenon was there in Christianity. You have the laying on of hands. And it was there also in Judaism. And it is there also in other traditions. And one of the things about the tradition is the fact that it gives you a special type of transmission which in our belief is what makes the faith a living thing and an organic thing. One of my teachers who I had the honor to be with for 19 years, uh, and he was a member, he was a product of the tradition. He used to say that if the tradition does not leave you in the present tense, it is not a tradition. So it's not going to take you back 300 years. It should bring you right here to this time and place. And the tradition has in it its own mechanisms that are able to look at how do we deal with continuity and discontinuity, what is innovation and what is not. And I would say that in Islam, that is a fairly sophisticated discourse. Uh, at least uh, we need to uh, revive it as such. In our community today, this is a big problem, that uh, Muslims uh, generally have an identity crisis in who they are and what they are and where they belong. And to me, this is because of the fact that the tradition has been put to the side. And therefore, although they may be very beautiful people and very good people and the work they do is tremendous, but unless they can uh, be relevant to this time and understand it, then they will become historical fossils or they will fall to the side. Mariam Shaibani, don't make it too difficult. Um, to what extent would you say that the traditional theological tradition um, can equip us to deal with some of the contemporary issues like new atheism, theodicy, scientism, and so on? Um, or would you say it needs to be supplemented or complemented by other um, uh, sciences or disciplines? And how do you envisage that that might be possible? Mm -hmm. One of the uh, basic principles of Islam is that um, you know, you have the ruling and you have the reality and you have the application of the ruling to the reality. So you have these three components that are there and they're very important. 
And uh, we have to, first of all, understand in great depths, you know, what is going on in the world today. And uh, many people would say that human beings cannot continue to live on this planet as if only they mattered. But one of the things about modern science and technology is that it goes about its business and it also has economic imperatives in which we don't matter. You know, so these are really important things. And in the Western world, we have many very intelligent thinkers, men and women, <clears throat> who understand these problems with great sophistication and understand that, as we said before, that the triumphs of the West have often been, uh, they've not been without uh, a certain precariousness. Okay, so where are we going with the society? Uh, where are we going with this technology? Or where is it taking us? If you work in something like IT, as many of you do here, um, you know, you have an invention that has been produced, and now you've got to be thinking 10 years ahead of where this is going to go. And basically, you have to take it there because otherwise you're going to go broke. You know, after the iPad, what comes after that? After the smartphone, what comes after that? Where do we go? And you know, so we need to really understand and we need to really think about what is going on in this modern age. What about it is truly good and sound? And what, think, what aspects about it are problematic? And then we have to understand how does and how would our tradition enable us authentically to respond to that? Would you like to uh, ask more about that? Yes. Yes, Jeremiah. Sorry. Um, you mentioned uh, the evolution of Islam in the African American community and then the rapid growth of the uh, immigrant community and the children of immigrants. From my experience, uh, these two communities have different worldviews. And you, you also said that in order for us to progress along this trajectory that you mentioned, we will have to reconcile and like come to uh, an agreement on what these universals are. Uh, do you see that, like, how do you see that happening? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you agree with my assertion that the worldviews are actually different. Mm -hmm. Well, um, this is a very important issue. And approximately one third of our community has been here for a relatively long time. And they are overwhelmingly African American. And they are overwhelmingly inner city. And they face the issues of the inner city. And they still produce scholars. Uh, we have, for example, people like Imam Zaid, who is one of the leaders at Zaytuna. And we have other African-American scholars there. You have people like Dr. Jackson, who comes out of the inner city of Philadelphia. And, he often, and he's one of the most brilliant human beings that I have ever known. And I'm very honored that he is accepted to be in our third lecture. And you have other people. We could name a lot of other scholars. So uh, the situation of the African American community is, socio, is in socioeconomic terms different. And the uh, largely immigrant community uh, that was brought here and which is generally well-educated, often highly educated, uh, generally quite affluent. Um, its different worldview, I would say, has a lot to do with class. It has a lot to do with uh, the influence of uh, the dominant culture on it as being accepted essentially as white. One of the things that Dr. Jackson said about 9-11 is that you'll see that the door of whiteness is now going to begin to close. But uh, also, one of the things that we have to be mindful of is that, by and large, uh, that immigrant community is one that is extremely scientistic. It is a community 
that is extremely interested in technology, and that's to be expected. They are people who are great scientists, great engineers, great doctors. They contribute to the society a lot, but they are not trained in the uh, philosophical underpinnings of these things that they're taught. Okay, and that creates a worldview which is very contradictory. So I believe that we have a massive task of education. And the kind of education that goes to those who are haves is not necessarily the type of education that goes to the have-nots. But it must be one of our objectives to bring together a community of scholars that represents all, and that also represents women as much as it represents men. And that shouldn't be, I don't think, especially difficult because of the fact that given the uh, way our community works, um, the talented individuals who are able to go into Islamic studies and something that's not going to make much money, uh, they're going to be usually women. That's the way our families work. And whereas the men are going to go into science and medicine and engineering and so forth. And occasionally you have exceptional people like Rami Nashashibi who go into anthropology and do all of these things that he does. But um, it's very important to bring these communities together. And it is possible, I believe, to have a worldview you know, which is there for all of them. That's the way that Islam was traditionally. You know, the worldview that it believes in is one for all social and economic classes. And it's one that has the purpose of creating unity and diversity. Yes. Do you have a question? I do. Okay. Well, it's more of a comment, but um, <coughs> I, uh, I was dreaming listening to you speak. And, I put you to sleep. And no, no, no. Hmm. More visions. Um, and it's, you alluded to this, that it's Earth Day. Hmm. And I was very intrigued by the rights of animals, that water has rights. And uh, Ken Stone, our dean, whom you know, hmm. is writing a book on uh, animals in the Hebrew Bible. Hmm. And um, these alienations and connections, technologies, science, create alienations, um, are, are a, uh, a common human problem. The, um, the degradation of the earth and its instrumentalization, common human problem. So what, my, what I was simply envisioning is with joy, a future in which you and Ken sit side by side and talk about the rights of animals, or we engage in a discussion about theologies of technology and the nature of alienation and connection. And um, I want to thank you for opening a window in my mind. Uh, unfortunately today, if you were to ask Muslims about the rights of animals, uh, they wouldn't know what to say. And uh, in fact, they would probably wonder if animals have rights? What are you talking about? But in traditional Islamic law, hukuk al baha'im wal hayawan, the rights of uh, domestic animals and wild animals is a fundamental part of the law and uh, a very beautiful part of the law. And it teaches that uh, this world is not your paradise. And this world shouldn't be your hell. But this world is the paradise of the animals. So they have a right to live here. And they must be allowed to share your space. And um, this is very, very interesting. Uh, traditional Islamic cities, for example, I mean, uh, traditional Islamic civilization was endowment civilization. Uh, 
our universities work on endowments. That's what enables them to be the kind of institutions that they seek to be. The traditional Islamic world was an endowed world. Endowments were very important. And endowments would be made for hospitals so that you could go to a hospital and not pay anything. And in fact, you would be paid to get well. And that was all from the endowments. And once you got well, this, this is not mythology. In the city of Cordoba, for example, uh, Christians came to Cordoba you know, to use the hospital. And then they were told, you can't come here because this is for Cordobans. And so they went to the judge, and the judge told them that, well, just stay here for three days, and you're a Cordoban. <laughs> OK, so they can go there. They don't have to pay. What, what is that? Health, car, health care that you don't pay for? And the doctors were paid. And also in those hospitals, they would use things like um, musical therapy, music therapy, because they understood that certain types of insanity and depression, that that is very important to you know, get people out of them. And then when the people were ready to get out of the hospital, they would make clothes for them, give you a new suit of clothing, and maybe even uh, some gold or silver. That actually happened. It's hard to believe, isn't it? But in the cities, also around every city, you have what are called green zones. And the green zones have rules. And the green zones, uh, generally, you have green zones around rivers. You have green zones around lakes. One of the things that makes Chicago so beautiful is the fact that we have lake, the lake shore. And of course, if you know the history of Chicago, that was a big battle to secure the lake. And of course, the McCormicks were never really defeated. That's why you have McCormick Place that is still on the lake. McCormick was very, very powerful. Okay, But uh, in Islamic law, you have to have a green zone so that everyone has access to the lake, everyone has access to the river, and it's not polluted. It is the right of water not to be polluted. Um, that's problematic today, isn't it? You know, but uh, you can create types of technology in which you don't have to do that. And um, in the green zones, the green zones are open for all the people to use, but not to build there, unless they have special permission in which the green zone will be extended. And then animals can be there. All the animals could usually be hunted, because in Islam, hunting was allowed to all social classes but it was supposed to be hunting for need and not for game, and it had certain rules. So that's, a, that's an amazing tradition, and that's why people who've studied that tradition, uh, we just feel that it's extremely foolish to reject it and to blame it uh, you know, for the failures of Muslims and not to respect that tradition that did what it could do at its time. And there's no doubt that that tradition also went through challenges, perhaps which it didn't meet very well, that led to a situation uh, you know, that was not able to meet the challenges of the modern age. Yes? Um, Avon, with the example of uh, community uh, we, we uh, united. Um, I found um, the article that where the Yusuf Ali translation um, had been founded um, in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia in back to um, the time bef uh, before World War One, and um, the, 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 that is a very difficult decision that the religion uh, scholar has to make a sacrifice um, or give up in another term that to provide the different meaning from the translation from the Arabic to Yusuf Ali translation and commentary. And my question, how you um, paralyze, par par paralyze, I mean, um, proportion to that generation to today? Um, well, 
our brother is asking about the Yusuf Ali translation of the Quran. And if I understand you correctly, uh, the fact that that uh, translation would probably lost its copyright because uh, I, I presume that happened, or maybe it sold its copyright, but that it was then uh, redone, refurbished in Saudi Arabia. And uh, that translation is readily available in most American mosques and Canadian mosques and European mosques. Uh, Yusuf Ali is an interesting person. Um, he did his translation in the Woking Mosque. And the Woking Mosque was one of the uh, early representatives of Islam in England. It's in Surrey, to the south of London. And Marmaduke Pickthall was also in that mosque. Um, uh, Abdullah Quilliam, who was a really interesting English Muslim, he also uh, came to Woking, and he's buried there in their cemetery. But Yusuf Ali's translation uh, of the Quran, I have a particular love for it because when I became a Muslim, it was the only access I had to the Quran. And one of the great things he does is have his running poem, uh, you know, which uh, we won't go into the details of that. But um, that translation was then taken um, by other people, and it was sort of polished up, and footnotes were put in. I think that's correct, right? And uh, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm not right about that. I don't pay a lot of attention to it. But Yusuf Ali's translation, if you want it, you should get the original. And that one was published in the 1920s or the 1930s. And um, I think that one of the great resources of the Muslim community today in the United States and in England and in Canada and the West is the fact that we have now some decent translations, really good translations. And um, one of the best is what's called the Gracious Qur'an by Sheikh Ahmed Zaki Hamad, Amr Halim, and Ibrahim Abu Sharif. Uh, that's, I think, a very good translation. There are also other ones as well. You're talking again about the Saudi translation? So the issue of gender, is that what you're asking about? Uh, the issue of gender is essentially a legal issue in Islam. And um, it is, again, uh, you know, something that we would dis discuss there. And we can do that at another time. Thank you. I, I just wanted to ask. Um, because I was uh, interested in this idea you talk about a community of scholars and of, of this task that we have in front of us. And maybe I was struck by this because I might find myself talking this way sometime and maybe directing in a certain direction. And then I got worried that when I hear you talking this way, I don't know if it would be directed towards me, but or not towards me, but towards other people um, mm -hmm. who I might associate myself with. I, obviously, I'm not. Uh, of the level to be of that community of scholars, but I have teachers that would be in that in that level, and goes back to this kind of idea of saying who has rejected the tradition, and obviously there are some people who openly reject the tradition, and and you spoke of some of them to some extent, but even some of those people would probably not necessarily describe themselves that way. They would describe themselves as finding certain things in the tradition they accept and certain things in the tradition that they reject or following a certain part of the tradition. So I'm just wondering, in the 
without, not, not in terms of deciding who's right or who's wrong, as you said, there has to be a room for a multiplicity of opinions, but in terms of deciding who can be part of that community you spoke about that has to agree on certain things, is that a narrow community or is that, uh, that has to accept all the things you described as being part of the tradition or is that a broader uh, community and how do we well, kind of decide the uh, boundaries of that? A community of scholars is not a club and uh, you know but for a community of scholars to deserve that term then they have to have certain areas that they agree on and that they buy into and um, otherwise they can be friends they can work together it's very important for us to be able to open discourse with everybody and um, if you talk about things like the traditional theological schools, uh, they don't have just one particular tradition. Um, you have also a Salafi tradition that is there, and that is highly respected in the tradition, even by those who uh, go beyond it or who build on it. And uh, in the law also, you have the approach of certain law schools that are very much concerned with what the text says and following the text. So I think that it's very important for us to be able to talk. And it's certainly not my prerogative to be able to say that this is the way we're going to do it. Um, we have to see what we agree on. And um, I hope to be able to work with anybody who is interested in doing that in a genuine way. And I hope that we can find a common ground, which is really positive. And uh, you don't have to, you, you, Muslims have to believe in God and they have to believe in his prophet. They don't have to believe in a tradition. And they don't have to buy into a particular tradition. So Dr. Omar, question for you. Um, so has this work started of having a community of scholars and where are we, where are we with the status as a whole? Um, I don't think that that work has started at a conscious uh, organizational level. Uh, the fact is that fortunately uh, a lot of us who uh, work together and who write together go to the same conferences and conventions uh, we like each other and uh, we respect each other so that's a community of scholars and exactly how that would form and even if it can form uh, I'm not really sure how that can be done but I do believe that intellectually that's the key thing, that um, an individual thinker, however uh, brilliant he or she may be, they are not likely to have a profound effect on their community or on the society at large until they can begin to cohere into what I have called a community of scholars. And Again, as I said before, you can see very good examples of that in the history of knowledge. You know, that around Plato, there is a community of scholars. And out of that comes Platonism. Around Aristotle, there is a community of scholars. And they understand what Aristotle is doing, and they articulate it for others. Had Aristotle not had that, then he probably wouldn't have had the same effect. In the West, we have many brilliant people. Uh, for example, you have Gian Battista Vico, one of the most brilliant Italian thinkers of all. But Vico never, he's really brilliant. Absolutely, the new science. But Vico never had a following. 
He affects Marx. He affects uh, Hegel. He affects other people. But Vico never gets a community of scholars. Vico's very much like Ibn Khaldun. He's very much like Arnold Toynbee. Had v and, but Vico also came from the underclasses. That's one of the reasons why you know, he, he was accepted in Italian society because of the fact that he was so intelligent. But then on the other hand, he was also marginalized because he was so poor. And uh, if you look also in Western society, you have, for example, uh, Hermann Lotze, who was a great German philosopher, Rudolf Hermann Lotze. Uh, he's really brilliant. I don't necessarily agree with everything that he says, um, but Lotze was a brilliant thinker of the 19th century, and he influenced a lot of people. And he is also a voice that is uh, listening to Leibniz, who was one of the most brilliant early modern philosophers, who was a brilliant critique of Descartes and, of, uh, and potentially of Kant. But Lotze never gets a following. He never gets a community of scholars. So I think that we have to be really conscious about that. Um, you know, we could begin to name scholars in our community. And I love these people. And they do great work. Okay, but if we don't create something around them that understands and maybe takes forward and articulates what they are doing and that enables it to be, um, you know, uh, to, to generate scholarship and work in the community at large, then very likely the effect of these people will be limited. It will not bring about a social transformation. And I think, again, if we look at uh, a lot of our mosques, in which the default position is often one that is very problematic, in my view and the view of many people, it's also because they do have communities of scholars. That's how this became the default position, that there are many men and women who buy into their particular point of view, be it culturally predatory, uh, be it whatever it may be. But there are ideas out there, and they buy into that, and they write about that, and they talk about it, and you get chutbah after chutbah that are coming out of where? But they're saying still the basic things. So in my understanding, that's because of the fact that there is a community of scholars. And uh, we need to create a community of scholars that we believe is worthy of the task that faces this community. Uh, in the history of the United States and Canada and South Africa and Australia and New Zealand and other parts of the English-speaking world in the colonial period, uh, there is a concept called first effective settlement. And um, I believe this is a very important concept you know, so, for example, when you bring these Europeans to the United States, Englishmen and women, Scots, Irish, Germans, French, Huguenots, and others, you know, how do you make them into a co coherent society? And so, in American history, in the course of the 1600s and 1700s, you have the emergence of first effective cultural settlements. In New England, that happens in Massachusetts and Connecticut. In the Mid-Atlantic, that happens in the Hudson River Valley and New York City. Uh, in the South, it happens in the Chesapeake Bay area, Maryland and Virginia. And it creates accents, it creates uh, ideologies, it creates types of personalities. Uh, the New Englander, for example, tends to be sort of orthodox and out to save the world. Uh, the mid-Atlantic American may be more like Walt Whitman, and he's heterodox, but pragmatic. Okay? So this is very important. Um, Africans who were brought to America, they also do this. And first effective settlement in the black community, according to what I've read, 
is something that takes place in the 1830s, especially after uh, the failure of the uh, rebellion of Denmark VC. Okay? And then you have, we, as uh, Michael Gomez says, they give up their tribal marks because the tribal divisions among Africans were very important, extremely important. And then all of a sudden you have the creation of black culture with a particular type of English that is spoken by uh, the uneducated and also a special type of black English that is spoken by the preacher. People that will uh, create the legacy inherited by Dr. Martin Luther King, because he is a black man speaking black English, which is also very beautiful, and Malcolm X. Okay, so that's really important. And when we look at this Muslim community in the United States today, it is to our advantage that we are not very big, that we are 1% or less, 1% or more uh, of the society. And that means that there's still time, hopefully. Although there are communities of scholars or thinkers or whatever we want to call them who have been working on the first effective settlement for some time. That's why it's the default position in so many mosques, okay? And if we do not do something, and if we are not able to be a positive influence, and that window may not be very big, who knows? It could be 50 years, it could be much less than that. That depends on things that are way beyond our control, including what happens in the news. Okay? But it's very important for that first effective settlement to be as uh, authentic, I would say, and genuine as it can possibly be. And then it will become the default position. And then the development of our community becomes something that is hopefully feasible and effective. Um, on the other hand, if we fail in that, then whoever effects that settlement, they become the default position, and we have to struggle against that, and our children have to struggle against that, and our grandchildren have to str struggle against that forever, or for a long time. And uh, that's not easy to do. And that may spell, that may spell failure. We have so many problems in our community today, right? Um, the phenomenon of the unmasked Muslim. And our, communi our community right now is not able to meet the emotional, spiritual, and religious needs of many members in our community. That's not good. And um, I feel that we have the obligation uh, to do something about that if we can. And I hope we'll be successful. First of all, I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking you, Dr. Omar, for your wonderful. Four quick announcements. Uh, building on this very thought-provoking foundation of how we got to where we are today, uh, the next two weeks, uh, in a week, we'll be, uh, Dr. Omar will be addressing uh, diversity and tolerance. Uh, and in two weeks with Dr. Sherman Jackson, a small mini community of scholars, uh, addressing good and evil. If you'd like more details, there is a program on the table outside. Um, the program runs from 7 to 9.30. Some publicity that went out on the web s said 7.30 to 9.30. That's not correct. I apologize for anybody who arrived late uh, because uh, we got mixed messages. They'll run 7 to 9.30, always with a break for Salat. We will have a bigger room for Salat next time. Um, uh, um, if you missed something tonight, uh, or if you would like to direct a friend to the, to the program, they can get it on our website. You can go to www.ctschicago.edu and get to it that way, or go to YouTube and look for Chicago Theological Seminary and, and find it on our YouTube channel. I don't know, it'll probably be posted in, within 48 hours. The last thing I wanted to mention, right, is um, 
Uh, if you happen to be a graduate student in the Chicago area, part of the seminary consortium or the University of Chicago, or maybe even we were just talking, I was talking with a Northwestern graduate student, we might be able to figure out a way to get it, you here too. You, will, you do have an opportunity to study with Dr. Umar in the fall or with Dr. Rami Nashashibi, who will also be teaching um, community organizing as a spiritual practice and uh, the American Muslim experience. So those are uh, a, a course in sociology, a course in community organizing, a course in theology, um, uh, a very rich off set of offerings in Islamic studies uh, that we would love to invite you to be able to join. We also have an auditing policy. If that's something that interests you, you can ask me about it later. Um, we have, through the Center for Jewish Christian Islamic Studies, a great deal of comparative courses, Jewish studies courses, Christian studies courses, and a growing number of Muslim study courses. Yes. Um, I just wanted to underline that the uh, classes with Dr. Amar, with Dr. Nashashibi, um, are for graduate credit, uh, though you can also audit. Right. They're graduate courses, it's graduate credit. Um, that's all for this evening. Thank you all very much for making the time to come out this evening. We hope to see you next week and bring your friends. We'll set up more chairs. <laughs>